David, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Thank you to UMBC for having me here, everyone who's funding this event. Thank you all for being here. Um, I really don't have words for what a treat and honor it is to be back uh, at my undergraduate alma mater giving a lecture like this. Um, I remember sitting in this room hearing Will Knoll give a lecture about the Archimedes Codex um, that uh, totally cracked my skull open. Um, and when I decided to try to have a career in academia, what made me think that would be a thing worth doing was the experiences I had here as an undergraduate. Um, and so um, I'm just so grateful to be back here and so grateful to this institution for everything it's done for me. So, I'm going to try today a skill, a new skill I have been working on. I'm going to try to deliver this talk uh, somewhat extempore over slides rather than reading from a script and attempt to kind of hold your attention a little bit more. Um, and so hopefully I can, you know, and I'm going to put my phone here so I know how long I've been talking for. <laughs> um, hopefully I don't forget what I was supposed to say for each of these slides. <laughs> um, Here's what I'm going to try to do in this talk, the stru structure-wise. I'm going to start out by telling you a story about a historical situation, um, a story about how things were. Um, and that story is about the role, as David said, of enslaved labor in the ancient Roman culture of the book. And that's going to end with a question I have about how to interpret some of our most prominent evidence for the use of enslaved labor in Roman book culture. And then I'm going to pivot to try to find a possible solution in what I think is a useful analogy from our current technological and cultural moment. Okay, so we'll start with this first half, which is what was the historical situation? We start with the question of what is a book? which is a question I ask every time I teach a book history class. It's a question we ask all the time in the study of book history. Um, and it's one of these questions where we all think we know what a book is, but then when you start trying to define it or you start looking at things and asking, is this or is this not a book, then you realize that like, you don't know what a book is at all. This is a very kind of like Socratic experience. But um, there's basically two ways we might think about a book. One would be um, uh, as a text, you know, say I have written a book or I'm reading a book, right? maybe the contents of a book. And the other way would be as objects, right? You can pick up a book, you can hold a book, all right? And um, I should say that just last week, I had this really great opportunity to go to a conference on Pliny the Elder uh, in Cumae, outside of Naples in Italy. And I got to visit the Archaeological Museum in Naples, which is really exciting because the whole, um, the whole area of the Bay of Naples was buried under the volcano in Mount Vesuvius that erupted in 79 CE, which means that the archaeological finds in this part of Italy are unparalleled anywhere else in the Roman world. So one of the things we have really great specimens of is paintings from Roman houses, these fresco plaster paintings. So I'm, I uh, busily added to my slideshow all these pictures I took in the museum in Naples just last week. Um, and here's a nice little picture of a, of a young man who seems to have won a prize. And you can see he's holding a book. That's a book. And I'll tell you more about why that's a book. Um, what makes a book culture distinct? So we get a little technical here. There's different ways we can talk about book histories, categories in book history. One might be a kind of periodization built around technology. So we say, is it okay if I get out and walk a little bit? I feel like it'll help me think. Okay, so one might be um, uh, that you know there was an era when books were written by hand. That was the manuscript era. And then there was the era of print. In Europe, we think about this as being a kind of hard line, although in other parts of the world, printing is developed and then kind of used for different things alongside manuscript. Um, but this is how we talk about the history of the book in Europe. First, you have handwritten books, then you have printed books. We might also talk about format, right? So you have scrolls, then you have codices. A codex is the form of the book we know today with a spine and pages. And now we have digital books. We might also talk about the materials books are made of, um, papyrus, then parchment, then paper. So when we tell these histories of book technology and book culture, we usually orient them around the object or the way the objects are made. And that raises a question for ancient historians of what is the defining technology of the Roman book? People might say, well, it's the scroll or it's papyrus. But what I'm going to try to argue in the next 25 minutes or so is that really the defining technology of Roman books is slavery, the Roman practices of enslavement that are threaded through all of Roman culture. Um, this gets us to thinking about both books as objects and humans as property, and the way that these two pra cultural practices um, kind of converge. 
So Roman books, when we talk about a Roman book, we're usually talking about scrolls made of papyrus. Papyrus is a kind of paper-like substance that you make out of plants that grow in the marshes and the Nile Delta and other marshy conditions. Um, and you take this stuff and you make it into paper and you make it into scrolls. So that's what this is. It's, it's open. The scroll is open. And that little tag there tells you what the title is. You write on it with an inkwell and a reed pen. And then eventually, in the Roman world, people start adopting codices. They start making them out of parchment, which is sort of more efficient for codices anyway. Um, the other important technology for Roman books is the waxed tablet. So this is a little hard to make out, but um, this is a set of hinged wooden leaves that have been covered in black wax. And you use a metal stylus to, to scratch in them. Um, and these are, uh, these are used for lots of different things in the Roman world, but one thing you use it for is like writing your first draft. And that's because the wax is erasable. So when we think about a Roman author like drafting something or making notes, they're doing it on this, and then it has to kind of get copied, the final draft has to get copied onto a papyrus scroll. So these are the objects that we're thinking of. And this is, this is from one of these wall paintings in a, in a companion, a Roman house in Campania. Um, and later I'll show you the rest of the picture, the other things that are next to it, but for now that's the, that's the basic gear that Romans are working with. OK, so what's a book? Uh, you might not be able to read this. It's OK if you can't read this. This is more for illustration. This is from a classic article in Book History Studies by a guy called Robert Darnton. And this is what Darnton called the communications circuit. So Darnton was trying to get people to think about ways of studying literature other than just like the author and the readers and what's in the book. And so Darnton's point was, if you tried to make a graph of all the people involved in the making and circulation of literature, you'd have a lot of people other than the author. So here's the author here. And he's got the publisher and the printers and the people who make the paper and the shippers and the booksellers. Over here are the readers. And here are the authors. And books exist in this really complicated network of labor and skill and material. Okay, so that's the, this is by now kind of an old idea in book history studies. But I think it's still an active challenge in the study of classical literature. How do we apply this model to ancient literature? Where in classical philology, classical literary studies, we're still often just kind of thinking about the author, right? And the, the text. You know, I, I sit down to write my first book and I write it about an author. As David said, I wrote about all this Gellius, right? Or we, we teach a class in Latin. We kind of say, this semester, we're going to read Virgil, right? So much of what we do is oriented around authors. Um, and so book history asks us to think about something other than authors. The book historians like to say, authors don't make books. And then they kind of like look at you significantly. And you're supposed to like think about the implications of that. OK. So. OK, so some things about Roman books. The first thing I want to talk about is the circulation of books. Um, how do Roman books get made? Well, they're copied by hand, one from another. So this is what media people would call a lossy form of copying. Every time you copy from one book to another book by hand, you're going to lose some information. You're going to introduce errors. Right? So I don't know if anyone here, I see a few faces here who might remember the age of cassette tapes. Right? So today, if you copy a file from your computer hard drive to a flash drive, you're going to get a, basically a perfect copy. Um, but like if you're copying, back in my day, if we wanted to like record music off the radio, we'd copy it down, uh, record it onto a magnetic tape, and then you could dub it onto another tape. And every time you copied it, the audio quality would kind of get a little bit worse. This is also a peer-to-peer -peer copying system, which means that if I want a copy of a book, I've got to go see if any of my friends have, a, have that book. And then I either ask them to make a copy, or I, may, I borrow it and I make a copy. Okay? And we also know that there's bookshops in ancient Rome. We know very, very little about these bookshops. I'll say more about what we do know about them in a minute. But for me, one of the big questions about Roman book circulation is what's the relationship and kind of what's the sort of quantitative ratio between books that are being made in houses as part of gift exchange and books that are being made for commercial sale in bookshops. We really like, don't have a good model for what that relationship is like. We just know that those are the two ways that it's happening. So who makes the copies? That's the next question you have to ask. Labor is what connects these different forms of media. Labor is what makes circulation possible. And we do know a lot about who's copying books in ancient Rome. And these are enslaved people. They're scribes who are enslaved. Okay? Sometimes they are formally enslaved, but usually they were, when they were enslaved, they were also scribes. And then they get manumitted and continue working as scribes. 
Um, we have inscriptions about these people. We have literary references to them. We have legal references to them. Here's just one little anecdote. The emperor Domitian got so mad at this one historian, apparently over some metaphors. We're not really sure what this means, but Domitian was like uh, not the most even keeled guy. So he's so mad at this author that he has him killed. And then he crucifies all the scribes who were responsible for copying the book, for publishing it. Now, crucifixion is a punishment you only use for enslaved people. So we can be really certain that when he says scribes, he means enslaved scribes. Bookshops. We know very little about bookshops. I've given you here an example. I can't find a picture of this, but this is, um, this is a sort of transcription of one of the inscriptions we have. We know the names of about six or seven booksellers from the whole, um, you kind of from ancient Rome, the city of Rome over centuries. We know about six names. Um, and we really don't know a lot about them, but based on their names, they all seem to be formerly enslaved people. So that's interesting. That's something we know about the book trade. If you run a bookshop, by which I mean you are making and selling copies of books in ancient Rome, 100% of the people who we know about in this business were formerly enslaved. This guy is really interesting. His name is Sextus Petechius Dionysius. And this name says to us, formerly enslaved. When you're an enslaved Roman, you get one name. And usually enslaved Romans are given Greek names regardless of their nationality or ethnicity. If you are manumitted, you are legally given your freedom. Every Roman has three names. So if you're an enslaved person, you're missing two parts of your name. So you get them from your enslaver. And then the name that was yours before becomes your cognomen, the name you're known for. So this guy was almost certainly called Dionysius, and he was owned and then manumitted by a guy called Sextus Petechius something something. And he calls himself a bubliopolo, which is a really funny word. It's a borrowing from Greek. It means something like bookmonger. Um, the more normal name would be a librarius. That's confusing because that's also the word for an enslaved scribe. It just means someone who works with books. So we have a lot of trouble sorting through the evidence here. Um, but in this case, we know this guy's a bookseller. Um, now, we should say, it's almost certainly the case that a big bookshop that's making a lot of copies of books has a staff. It's not just one guy running it. And they may well be an enslaved staff. So we're talking about books on the one hand being copied by slaves in big households, and then also books being copied maybe also by slaves in bookshops. So what does that mean? And so this is the next question for an historian. Is like, so what? <laughs> by which I mean, does it matter? Is it? Is it of material significance to Roman book trade and the circulation of books that the people doing the work were enslaved? Or is it just kind of incidental? In other words, like, how do the particular features of Roman slavery affect or shape Roman book circulation? Well, here's one example. The poet Marshall, who is the, Ra the Roman poet who tells us more than any other about kind of the business of books and kind of like promoting his own books, at the right at the beginning at the of his first book of epigrams, he tells you where to buy his books. And he says, so that you know where I'm for sale, so you don't have to wander through the whole city, let me be your guide. Look for Secundus, the freedman of the learned Lucensus, behind the entrance of the Temple of Peace in the form of Pallas. What he's telling us is that this guy Secundus is the bookseller to whom he's given like a high quality final draft of the book. So if you want the best quality copies of his book, Secundus has the kind of authorized um, authorial manuscript. Um, now if you are a Roman who is enslaved and manumitted, and you have to put your name up on a sign for a business or for a tombstone or something like that. Well, let me take a step back. If you're a Roman who's freeborn and you have to put your full name up somewhere, you put your full name up and then you say your father's name. You say so-and-so, son of so-and-so, Marcus, son of Marcus. Now, the legal practices around Roman slavery are such that when you are enslaved at Rome, you are legally stripped of your parentage. So when you're manumitted, you do not legally have a father. So what do you do? What the Romans do here is something called pseudo-filiation. A formerly enslaved Roman who needs to write out his full name, instead of saying Marcus, son of Marcus, will say Marcus, freedman of Gaius, or something like that. So in this case, we, we have this bookseller Secundus's name 
kind of in the form that it might appear in a, in a formal context. He's the freedman of Lucensis. But Marshall has added this little twist. He's not just the freedman of Lucensis, he's the freedman of the learned Lucensis. This is where we gotta think about what is the importance of the relationships that occur between formerly enslaved people and their former enslavers. What's the significance of that to the way the book trade works? So when a Roman who is enslaved is manumitted, they don't just kind of walk away at fully disentangled from their former enslaver. They enter another kind of relationship the Romans have called clientage. So the former enslaver now becomes a patron. And the patron-client relationship is another one of these essential unequal relationships that kind of structures Roman society. And it entangles the client to the patron in all sorts of ways. For formerly enslaved people, it might mean that they still have to work for their former enslaver in some way. Um, they might also now have social access or political access to their former enslaver's household or resources or network in some way. So we think about what it means for a bookseller to advertise yourself as a bookseller in terms of your former enslaver. And in this case, the former enslaver, Lucensis, has a reputation for being learned. What does that mean? What could we find in Lucensis' house? We'd probably find a really nice, well-stocked library. Now that's important because if you're the bookseller Secundus and you want to charge people you know, top dollar for good books, you need to be able to say that you have a really good selection of books and that you have very high quality copies of books. In other words, if you're gonna be running a Roman book selling business, you don't just get them from a warehouse or something. You need what are called exemplars, books to copy from. So my hypothesis about this guy is that part of his branding as a bookseller is that he's got access to his patron's library. He can get you really good stuff from his patron's library, all right, more than your average bookseller could. So that's like one hypothesis I have about how the particulars of Roman slavery shape the particulars of the Roman book trade. We'll say a little bit about how Romans do other things with books. What's the, what are the other things we do with books? Well, we read them, right? Now, the Romans very famously enjoyed reading with their ears. They enjoyed being read to. Um, uh, they could read to themselves silently with their eyes, but um, it was fun and convenient uh, to be read to. You could be read to while you had dinner or in the bath. If anyone, uh, you know, like me, doesn't have enough time to read books with their eyes and that's their reading done through audiobooks, you can kind of relate to this. We have a lot of references to these people. So here's a little anecdote from the senatorial author Pliny the Younger, a letter to a friend where he's complaining um, that one of his enslaved readers um, uh, can't read because he made him, Pliny made him read too much while they were on the road and he like breathed in too much dust. And now he's coughing up blood. This is actually kind of a gruesome, a gruesome um, uh, context for this. And Pliny uh, says, well, it would be really sad for him, but it would be really painful for me if I can't use him as a reader anymore. So you can see the like relative devaluing of enslaved people, even enslaved people who the enslaver kind of purports to feel affection for. Um, and then he talks about why it's so nice to have a good reader. He says, well, he reads my books to me really well. He like loves my words and he holds my attention when he reads to me. So these are some of the kinds of pleasures you get out of, out of being read to. What's interesting about this is that there's a lot we don't know about these readers. Most of the time when readers are referenced, they're implied by the grammatical passive of a verb. What do I mean by that? Romans I often like to say things like, here's a quote from Pliny, and I'm going to read the Latin. He says, ambulo ungor exerceor lavor liber legitur. Okay, so these are, these are all passive verbs. He's saying, oh, I'm going for a walk, I'm getting oiled, my trainer is exercising me, I'm getting bathed, a book is being read. All of these passive verbs imply that someone is doing the work for him, someone is taking care of him, but he doesn't name them, he doesn't specify them. They disappear into the kind of grammatical construction of the verb, and that means we know hardly anything about them. We don't know their name, we don't know their age, we don't even know their gender. And I'm mentioning gender because although none of the literary sources from ancient Rome mention reader slaves who are women, the inscriptional records are full of them. So here's some examples. We have, this is my favorite one. This is um, a woman called Knide, and she's, she boasts that she is electrix. She's in the house of Drusus Livii. This is a kind of minor branch of the Augustan family. And she's put up this memorial for her husband, who is a valet. This one's a little rougher, but um, 
This is for a, a female reader slave called Derkato, or Derkato, and she is enslaved by a woman called Aurelia Weirgo. And we do have some, uh, some male reader slaves all over the inscriptional record, too. So if you're familiar with Livia, wife of the Emperor Augustus, she had an enslaved reader called Paninus. Um, and that's like all we know about him is his name. Okay, so these reader slaves seem to be everywhere, and we know almost nothing about them, and they disappear very quickly. Um, this is a long story that you don't need to read. I'm going to summarize it to you. But this is my attempt to give you a so what about slavery and Roman reading. So here's an anecdote from the author I wrote my first book on. His name is Aulus Gellius. And he's telling a story, or he's relating a story, about the philosopher Plutarch. Um, if you've studied any Roman history, you might have read Plutarch's Lives of the Romans and Greeks. Plutarch also writes a lot of philosophical treatises. This is an anecdote about Plutarch ordering the beating of an enslaved person in his household. If you can believe it, this actually belongs to a kind of subgenre of philosophical writing in Greek and Roman antiquity of stories about great philosophers beating enslaved people, which is sounds pretty gruesome, and it is. And the point is basically about kind of anger management. Um, there's a kind of whole um, tradition of stuff here about basically the importance of not beating people while you're angry. And the actual experience of the person being beaten is fully incidental to this stuff. So this belongs to this tradition. And in the story, we hear that this slave, who we know nothing about, except that he's insolent and worthless. This is a kind of classic, um, sort of stereotypical way to an, introduce an enslaved person. In other words, don't bother thinking about him as a human being. But the details that his ears have been moistened with the disputations of philosophy. What does that mean? <laughs> it means he works in the household of Plutarch. And Plutarch is constantly reading books, having books read to him. He's writing books. He's having friends over. They're reading books together. They're having philosophical arguments. And this guy's like passing through the room. And he's soaking it all in. Okay. So this guy, he's done something or other. We don't know what. He's being beaten. He's saying, I don't deserve this. And then he starts complaining to his enslaver. He says, Plutarch, you wrote a book about how to not be angry. And here you are violating the precepts of your own writings. He's trying to deploy some of the philosophy he's learned in his own defense. And Plutarch says, well, look, if you'd read my book, you'd know that I'm not angry right now because I don't have any of the physical symptoms of anger. And then he says, carry on with the beating, which is <laughs> funny and awful. You can see the way that this is really a story at the expense of the enslaved person and about the kind of wit of the enslaver. But what's really going on here, I think, is that we have a guy who has been participating in reading as a kind of overhearer, right? He's present in the room. He's a, he's a waiter or, or something, right? And, and the enslaver, because an enslaved person passing through the room can also participate in these group reading exercises, it becomes important for the enslaver to say, no, you're not really a reader. I know you were here when the books were being read, but you don't get to count as a reader. And this is what the historian Daniel Padilla Peralta has called the, manuf or the, the um, production of sharp ontological distinctions. So Roman masters spend a lot of time worrying about how to insist that enslaved people and enslavers are fundamentally different. And they have to do that precisely because it's obviously not true. Okay? So what we're getting out of this is that reading, which happens all the time with enslaved people all around and present, actually is a, it's not just kind of a natural process like switching on an audiobook. It's something where the, Romans are, the Roman enslaving class is really worried about maintaining their power and maintaining control. Okay, so this is another way in which I think that the particulars of slavery are really fundamentally shaping what's going on when Romans are reading in the presence of or with the use of enslaved labor. How do Romans write books? Now we're getting into the meat of it. How do Romans write books? Well, they dictate. Now they can write by hand. We have a lot of evidence for Romans writing by hand. They seem to alternate between writing by hand and dictating as circumstances and convenience and personal preference um, uh, allow or require. But a lot of times they're dictating to enslaved secretaries and stenographers. We know a lot about this. We have shorthand manuals. We have surviving contracts from Egypt about um, people being apprenticed, enslaved people being apprenticed to learn shorthand so that they can do this work. Okay? They use these secretaries and other enslaved literary workers to help them revise and recopy their drafts, right? So even if you're a Roman author who never dictates and who always writes all his drafts longhand, that's got to get copied into a book at the end of the day, and you're going to need a secretary to do that. 
And they use enslaved secretaries and research assistants to gather and organize source material for their work. And here's where we have to note that Roman literature, as a general category, is often just labor intensive. Like if you've ever read any Roman literature, you know that it's full of references and allusions and quotations. And it's often either telling you what it thinks of some earlier book or kind of performing its rewriting of an earlier book. Right? So you either get someone like Pliny the Elder who says, well, I read three different versions of this story and here's the one I think is true. Or you get someone like Virgil who writes the Aeneid and what you can tell is that he's rewriting Homer and he see it in Lucretius and all these other authors. Okay. So a lot of forms of Roman literature require a lot of work, and the people who are doing the work or helping the author do the work are enslaved. I want to zero in now on or zoom in on this guy, uh, Pliny the Elder. And Pliny the Elder, thinking about him a lot because I was just in Cumae. Uh, Pliny the Elder very famously died in 79 CE when Mount Vesuvius erupted. He was commander of the Roman fleet at Mycenaeum. He sailed into the volcano. Um, uh, to try to rescue people um, and uh, died on the shores of the, of the Bay of Naples. And when he died, he left behind an enormously prodigious literary output, including his 37-volume encyclopedia called The Natural History. And he also left behind a nephew who had, um, uh, who was a real, who had real aspirations, literarily and politically and socially. And so his nephew, Pliny the Younger, also wrote a lot. And one of the things Pliny the Younger left behind is a little sketch of his uncle and how his uncle worked. And it's the form of a letter to one of his friends. He says, oh, friend, I hear you're interested in my uncle's work. Let me tell you how he was able to accomplish so much. Um, and what younger Pliny basically says is that his uncle just never stopped reading. At all times of day, he was reading and making notes and dictating things to himself. And even when his body was otherwise occupied, he kept going, reading and writing and making notes, using enslaved literary workers. So I'm going to show you now what this sketch looks like. Sorry about all the text here. I, I know there are some Latin students in the audience, so I've given you the Latin and the English. Um, and this is my translation, so you should feel free to critique it afterwards. Here, just give you some fragments here of um, uh, some details from this sketch of the great, the great man at work. Often after lunch in the summer, if there was no business, he would lie in the sun while a book was read and he made notes and excerpts. He didn't read anything without making excerpts. After dinner, a book was read and annotated. On vacation, he only spared bath time from literary work. And when I say bath time, I mean when he was actually underwater. Because while he was being scraped and wiped, he would always listen to a book and he would dictate. While he was traveling, he made time for this. At his side, there was always a stenographer with a book and notebooks. And in winter, his hands were protected by mittens. OK. What's going on here? This is like a really busy guy. And I think there's a really interesting comparison for this sketch of Pliny the Elder in Pliny's own encyclopedia. Book seven of his encyclopedia is about humans and what makes humans interesting. And there's a part where he talks about how the human mind works and the uniquely human mental faculties. And it gets into something that he calls mental vigor, which does not easily translate, I think. So we'll just call it mental vigor. He says, I think, now this is Pliny himself talking, I think the person born with the greatest mental vigor was the dictator Julius Caesar. I'm not talking about his manliness or constancy, so it's not an ethical thing, nor a sublimity that encompasses all the things contained in heaven, but of an intrinsic force and quickness winged, so to speak, with fire. So this mental vigor is just like how fast and powerfully your mind works. We understand, Pliny says, that Caesar was accustomed to write or read at the same time, uh, write or read, and at the same time to dictate or be read to. So he's got either a notebook or a book in his hands, and then he's got someone reading to him or he's dictating to them. This is like almost impossible to imagine. And he was accustomed to dictate to his secretaries four letters at once on four different topics. You imagine him with kind of a, a row of secretaries and he walks up and down the line dictating and he's got in his head, he's tracking four different, four different letters. This is like truly remarkable. What I think is going on here is an idea that the intellect of the great man is so powerful that it exceeds the bounds of its own body. It has to absorb the bodies of other people and make use of the bodies of other people. Okay? If he, he, he doesn't have enough hands to write four letters. He's got a mind that can write four letters at once, but he doesn't have enough hands to write four letters at once. So he takes other people's hands and uses them. 
this is an idea that we see all throughout Roman culture. It's, it's, we have to be clear, this is real enslaver logic. It's like a very particular fantasy of people who practice slavery. This idea of a masterly extensibility, we call it. It's this idea in which the bodies and personhood of the enslaved can be subsumed into the enslaver. It's a version of a very common idea. So like, when we say, well, who conquered Gaul? Or like, Caesar conquered Gaul. Well, no, actually, right? all the people in Caesar's army conquered Gaul. We do this all the time, the Romans do it all the time. But there's a very specific, forceful version of this, in which enslaved people really can, in the Roman imagination, be somehow absorbed into the enslaver's body. And it leaves all sorts of questions like, well, what happens to their personhood? You know, what happens to their mental interiority, their autonomy? And if Romans are thinking about reading and writing this way, or is thinking about slavery this way, how does this impact reading and writing when this is the model for how reading and writing are getting done? How should we think about mental vigor? We all know working with language is complicated, right? You have to make a lot of decisions on the fly while you're reading and writing. We also know that collaborative research projects require people to work independently. Um, if you've ever read anything about distributed cognition, you know that humans are very good when they work on a project together, of distributing different parts of that project and skill amongst themselves. And we know that, that skill often lives in the body in kind of surprising or counterintuitive ways. So all this for me just raises the question of how did Roman literature actually, actually get made? Right? We have this picture of the great man's mind reaching through all these bodies into all these books and notebooks at once. But I guess I'm wondering, like, is that really what's going on? The story of Roman authorship is that you have many hands and eyes working with the words and the pages, but there's only one mind doing the thinking. So my question is, do we believe this story? Do we think this is true? We have one ancient note of caution. Um, uh, the rhetorician Quintilian says of the philosopher Seneca that, okay, he was pretty smart, he knew a lot of things, but he was now and then misled by those to whom he had entrusted the research into certain topics. I think this means he lets his research assistants do his research for him, and he doesn't check their work. Um, this is one of the only occasions which a Roman actually admits the possibility that that might happen. So if we want to be really skeptical about this, how would we be skeptical? What is the exact question we would want to ask? So here's where I'm going to turn to artificial intelligence and try to use this as an interpretive model for this. When I talk about AI, this is where I've got to be clear, especially for any AI heads in the room. I'll be clear what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this current generation of large generative models. Okay? So you probably encountered GPT or BART, and like that. We have these large image generators like Dolly, which is now part of the Microsoft Bing sort of family. Um, I'm not talking about targeted machine learning operations um, uh, or applications. And I'm going to be like, I'm not going to get into kind of too much of the technical detail. Um, uh, but what I'm talking about really is this kind of current crop of large generative models that we're all seeing in the headlines. This is interesting for two reasons. One, because I think artificial intelligence is, a, is an incorrect name for these things. And understanding why that's the case is useful. It's also important because these tools are being deployed, adopted, and talked about at such a scale and at such a speed as to really elevate the stakes for misrepresenting what they are and what they do. For example, the writers, the screenwriters, and the actors in Hollywood just struck for like five months. I think the actors are still on strike around major issues in their workplace, including the application of AI to their creative work, ideas, and likenesses. So what I'm going to try to argue in the next 10 minutes or so is that artificial intelligence in this moment is best understood as a kind of story. And it's the same kind of story as this story that we see the Romans telling about authorship. So what do I mean by this? Let's think about this word intelligence. Intelligence is not really what these tools do. Okay? Intelligence, this is an example of how we use the language of, of the human mind to make a claim that computers can simulate human mental capacities. And, and the, the language of these tools and around these tools is riven with sort of language from, in some cases, pretty old models of how human brains work, like neural net. Um, we call these machine learning systems. Which, what machine learning systems really do is they identify patterns in large amounts of data. They identify patterns that otherwise it would be really hard to explain to the computer what to see. So if you want to make a computer program that can drive a car, jury's still out on whether that's actually possible, you want to make a computer program to drive a car, it needs to recognize what it sees on the road. It needs to learn how to recognize a bicycle. It's really hard to explain to a computer what a bicycle is, but if you showed a lot of pictures of bicycles, it might be able to make its own rules for recognizing bicycles. So if you've ever tried to log into a website and been asked to select all the images that contain a bicycle, 
you've been tagging data for a machine learning system. Okay? If you want to develop a computer program that can translate languages, you need a lot of good bilingual textual material to train it on. So Google Translate is a good example of a machine learning system. Interesting, nobody ever calls Google Translate AI, but it's a machine learning system. And this is why Google Translate is really bad at Latin, because you don't have a good, you don't have a good data set for training it the way you do with most other modern languages. Language models were developed originally to study language by identifying patterns in them. If you feed them more language, they can identify more patterns and they can identify them better. And this is what we're finding with this generation, like with GPT-3 and 4, is that it turns out there's a lot about language that we might have thought was conceptual, but that's actually encoded in the form of language. That's why these things produce such uncanny output. So what happened is we took these systems for, our, for making, recognizing patterns in language and we ran them backwards to generate text that follow those patterns. So if you open up ChatGPT and ask it a question, it's not going to look up the answer to your question. It's going to start writing an answer and every word, it's going to try to figure out what the most likely word will come next is based on the rules that it's written for describing the data it's been trained on. Okay? This is why they're really good at producing plausible sounding nonsense. That's why they're bad at doing things that we really want you to do when you're like writing a paper, like take a position. You know? The computer can't take a position. It can just kind of predict what word is most likely to come next. Um, that's because they don't think. That's why you shouldn't let it write a bibliography. Right? Um, I asked ChatGPT to generate a bibliography on Pliny the Elder yesterday, and it gave me some citations to books I really wish existed, but that <laughs> definitely don't. <laughs> OK, let's think about this idea artificial. When we call AI artificial, we're emphasizing its nature as something computational or mechanical. Okay? But how does AI get made? We've been talking about how machine learning works. It basically applies insane quantities of raw computing power to identifying patterns in its training data, and then figures out ways to replicate those patterns. But they're kind of like baby birds. They need their data pre-digested. So I was talking about how if you want a computer to start recognizing what's in images, you have to tell it what's in the image in the first place. It can't just learn what a bicycle is. You have to show it a bunch of pictures of bicycles. Text generators work a little differently, but in order to really map patterns in language with any sophistication, they need a ton of language to chew on. So all the major large language model text generators out there, like GPT, BARD, these have all been trained on massive data sets, um, scrapes of the open internet, websites like Reddit, um, and no most notoriously, there's a huge database out there that these systems use of basically thousands of pirated uh, published literary works that are, of course, great examples of human language. So machine learning runs on human input. Okay? So it's not kind of artificial ex nihilo. It's, it's rules that have been written by computers about things that humans do and say. And the, for these large generative models, the people who make that data, make, that, make, that, um, make those human expressions that become the training data, they aren't compensated for that. The other really important human component in what we call artificial intelligence is the moderation and secondary training that's used to guide these models to write better rules. So when you're developing and training one of these systems, they'll quickly start identifying patterns that you don't want them to identify. They might just be wrong patterns. Like, Let's say it turns out that all the pictures of a bicycle that you showed your computer happened to have red bicycles in them. Right? Then it might not think that a bicycle is thing with a thing with two wheels. It might think a bicycle is anything red. So you have to kind of correct it and say, oh, no, actually, that's not true. And you can see how immediately these start encoding all kinds of things like racial bias into the data set rules. Okay. So sometimes these systems identify patterns that are accurate, but that we do not want them to be identifying. Or they identify patterns that are accurate, but we do not want them to be repeating those. So like, if you train a large language model on the internet, it's going to quickly internalize a lot of like, horrible, prejudicial, hateful language. Right? And you don't want it to be reproducing that stuff. Um, and if you've ever um, used some of these large generative models that are available for free use today, you'll see that they have a ton of guardrails in them around this stuff. So these models have to be trained and moderated by humans throughout their development and deployment. That moderation is often undercompensated, treated as unskilled. It's digital piecework. Um, a lot of people who do it are in the global south. They don't have regular or predictable working hours. They don't have such um, opportunities for advancement. And when that moderation involves trying to keep the computer from reproducing like uh, offensive or graphic content, then sitting and looking at these things for hours can take a real psychological toll. So this is like hard, exacting, poorly compensated human labor.
Okay, so we have these large models that are being marketed to us as AI, but they're not artificial because they're built on human input and labor, and they're not intelligent because they don't think. They just identify and reinstantiate patterns. So we have this moment where we're being told a story about AI, and that story suppresses the human and emphasizes the machine. So I want to now look in closing at why this story uh, works, why we're being told it, and what it has to do with that Roman story of authorship and why the Romans told that story. Remember, that Roman story of authorship is one where some people are reduced to the status of tools or machines, and, another, and one person gets elevated. So this is a picture of the Mechanical Turk. I could talk for two hours right now about the Mechanical Turk. But I'll just say there's a famous automaton from the late 18th century in Europe that supposedly played chess by itself. And actually, what was going on, spoiler alert, is there was a guy in there. And he was just folded up real small so people wouldn't think there was a guy in there. And so people thought it was a clockwork machine that could play chess. Why am I talking about this? Well, the simple takeaway from the Mechanical Turk is that it's easier to impute intelligence to a machine if you can't see the human who's powering it. So if your encounter with the technology hides the human element, you're more likely to think that there's no human involved. It's sort of an obvious point. But let's think about the way I was saying a minute ago that in Roman literature, enslaved people actually are often invisible. They are often made invisible. Okay? So that's why this story works so well, because Romans get in the habit of not seeing and not talking about enslaved people. There's also what I'm calling the charismatic facade. So here we might think about both the mechanical Turk, which looks like a human. They give it this kind of human body. And we might think about the way that OpenAI, once they had perfected GPT-3, they stapled a chatbot interface on it so that you could talk to it in natural human language, just like you would message with a friend. It's easier to impute intelligence to a machine when the machine has an interface that simulates the experience of talking to a human. Okay, what does that have to do with Roman literature? We here might think about why Romans write books. One reason that Roman write, Romans write books is to broadcast their identity to other people in time and space, to make themselves bigger as public figures. Why do Romans read books? One well, part, reading a book, we have this experience today. Reading a book by a Roman author gives you the illusion and the fantasy of communing with that person. Right? So we kind of, the Romans put a charismatic facade on Roman literature when they put one name on the book. We might think about how, as, as far as we can tell, it was common for Roman libraries to have little busts of each author along the bookshelves to sort of let you know who you were talking to, as it were. Why do we have these stories? Well, I was talking a minute ago about how these large generative models are in some, in some ways built on intellectual property theft. Could the companies that develop large-scale AI afford to compensate the people who create their training data in a way that in any way correlated to the profit they derive from the tool? No, that would like defeat the business model. Similarly, for Romans, if you're a Roman author, Pliny the Elder, Cicero, whatever, you're publishing literature in part to augment your own reputation. There would be no point to sharing that reputation with your enslaved workforce. It's just like is not why you do it. Okay, so there's what we might think of loosely as a profit motive. Okay, for this, this story. And the other is what we might think of as domination. This is a little hard to explain, but I want to think about the marketing of AI in this post-pandemic moment. Okay, so the story we get about AI is that it's going to make, um, it's going to make creative and intellectual labor less valuable or obsolete. You don't have to pay an artist or a writer anymore. The computer will do it for you. Something we need to note is that we're in a moment where intellectual and creative workers in a lot of sectors are mindful of both their value and their vulnerability, right? And it's actually like we were in record, a, a record period of new union formation in this country, okay? So I think part of what's going on here is that tech and capital are colluding to discipline the labor force. There is a, there is a value to the people who control these companies, like media companies, press companies, to saying to their workforce, you are fungible, you are replaceable, you're not worth as much as you think you are. There's an argument going on here about the nature and value of labor. Okay. Similarly, the status structures of tech companies are such that if you started trying to recognize, say, moderation and training labor the same way as you recognize and compensate software engineers or executives, the whole social system would collapse. I want to think back to this story about Roman slave, uh, Plutarch's slave, right, where you had to really tell the slave that he's not a reader in exact defiance of the fact that he's clearly been reading quite a lot. It might be necessary for Roman master authors to assert 
the fiction that they are doing all of the work themselves, precisely because otherwise it's obvious that they are not doing all the work themselves. In other words, that this fiction about what counts as work in the context of Roman authorship is part of this bigger project of maintaining stability and control in the Roman household. Right? So the need to preserve the stability of unequal labor relations leads to the propagation of these discursive systems that are meant to devalue some kinds of work and subject them to this ontological difference. So this mental vigor story of Roman reading, and here's the rest of the picture. And what I was not showing you is that the book and the notebook are next to big piles of money. That's the complete thought, as it were, okay? The analogy with this modern story of AI suggests that not only should we be skeptical of the idea that Pliny is the only one writing the natural history, but we should think about the function of that story in social historical terms. Now, is this true for any other Roman authors, or is it just Pliny the Elder? Well, here's my like, brief gesture to what it might mean for other Roman authors. Um, I mentioned a minute ago that like Virgilian Hexameter is also full of references to lots of other work. So Virgilian Hexameter is also very labor intensive to write. In fact, isn't it interesting that the Romans adopt from the, from the Hellenistic world the most labor intensive forms of literature that they can? I could say more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. I wonder if there's some awareness of this that's being thematized in book six of the Aeneid when um, Aeneas goes to visit the Sibyl at Cumae. And there's all these images about how hard it is to be one artist and how hard it is to manage all the materials that you're working with. And particularly when the Sibyl speaks, she's in this cave that has a hundred holes in the front of the cave. And so when she speaks, she has a hundred voices that all speak with one voice. That to me is a very compelling image for the actual working conditions in which Roman literature is made. So what's a book? I think that interrogating the technology and materiality of Roman books, which is where I started, can lead us to a new understanding of the nature and function of literature itself. It's not kind of neutral, doesn't exist in sort of an abstract void. It's deeply connected to basic structures of power in the Roman world. Labor conditions and the socioeconomic imperatives around those labor conditions lead us to, set, to tell certain kinds of stories about what work is, who can do it, how it's valued, how it actually gets done. And this is true today, and it's true in the Roman world. And trying to solve a puzzle from the ancient past, like this puzzle of the Roman book and how did authors really write, I think this can point us toward new ways of thinking critically about problems in the present. So for me, that's kind of the payoff of asking these sort of deceptively simple questions like what's a book and how do books get made? And that's my talk. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. And I have, I have some further reading and citations from the talk if you want to if you want to read more. So we're going to open the floor. We're going to open the floor up to questions. Yeah. So uh, please do ask. Sure. Who wants to start? Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Please. Um, so in regards to the Roman master authors, um, wanting to want like be assume like no, we are the ones writing these books. Um, how would that um, not necessarily conflict, but the idea that at that class of Roman, you were expected not to be really using your hands for work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like, I wonder, like, does that also factor into that at all? Or? Yeah, I, that's a really good question, because one thing it gets to is the very tricky question about whether or not this is work. Right. right? And, and you can see these interesting images in Latin poetry about, like, you know, is it was it Ovid talks about the labor limae, the, the work of revising and kind of shaving away the poetry, right? Um, and uh, one way of thinking about this is actually to take it back all the way back to Cato and the, and the kind of Middle Republic. And Cato, you know, this Cato the Elder is one of our first surviving works of Latin prose, is this farming manual by this guy Cato the Elder. And um, uh, there's a great article about this by Brandon Ray, where he talks about the way that when w our first account we have by Roman, by a Roman, about what a farm is and how a farm works, comes to us after Italy has been transformed by the mass enslavement of the rest of the Mediterranean. 
So if you look at Roman culture, you see these very old memes and ideas about the gentleman as farmer. You think about like Cincinnatus, right, who like has, a, has this career, is called up to an emergency, then goes back to his farm. So the Romans like sort of fantasize about themselves as gentlemen farmers. But then like already by the time Cato is writing, they're not gentlemen farmers. They're plantation owners. They're doing farming with like hundreds, if not thousands of bodies. And then what Cato does in this farming manual is gives you a way to imagine yourself as a farmer doing a noble kind of work in a context where other people's bodies are actually doing the work. And that, that kind of suggests that this is actually an essential tension for the Romans. That's like with them from the second century BC onwards. Um, you know, arguably part of what's happening in the, in the terms you've, you've used to frame this is that the, the Romans are separating out mind and body, right? So in this kind of fantasy of mental vigor, where you're just sort of sitting there surrounded by all the bodies doing the work, the, the stuff that a noble or an elite person should be doing is, reduced, is, is made thought, it's made mental, right? And anything that's done with hands, right, is, well, you could do it yourself, but you could just as easily distribute it to someone else. So, on the one hand, elite Romans need to be able to read and write with their own hands because they like send each other letters and stuff. So it's not fully what we would call banausic work to read and write with your hands. But nonetheless, they're investing a lot of effort in unplugging the mind from the body in some way. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, this, that was just a very interesting and astute observation. And I, I really, really appreciate this. And just, it's such an interesting idea. And I, you know, as a flash major, I love just general questions like, what is a book? Is awesome. <laughs> I think this is really, really timely, even a bigger way. Because you said, like, you're talking about work even. And you're right. Like, if we don't start valuing something, what, what is human effort even worth when a robot or an AI could do anything? Mm -hmm. Like, what are humans are worth doing? Right? Mm -hmm. And so, you have hit it, you go back to ancient history and you look at that. So, like, historically, when did this change? Hmm. You know, did like the Byzantines still have the slaves? Like, because they had a uh -huh. like, merchant class that were in the region, right? And yeah. Like, Boethius didn't have slaves, right? Mm. I don't know. Like, when did, when, did the, when did this system break down? Because yeah. Romans were a very unequal side, even worse yeah. than us, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So, mm, you're putting me on the spot. I don't know when we think slavery really slows down in the Byzantine world, but let me talk about the Latin West. Because there, the story, the typical story about like literary work and book work is that in what we might think of as the classical period up through the high Roman Empire, so like second, third century, that your average elite Roman is still a mass enslaver. All this book work is still being done largely with enslaved labor, although probably by the third century, the bookstores are taking over more and more of it. And maybe you have generational bookstores, so maybe more and more of them are freeborn uh, artisans. And then there's this period where the sources are a little quiet. And then when Western European book labor picks up again, who's doing all the book labor for about 800 years? It's monks. So all this stuff kind of moves into the monasteries. And there's a still, I think, a really big question there about how and why that happens. But one of the interesting things about that is that the early monastic communities are like elites, you know? So it goes back to your question, right? So something has to happen in the early Christian monasteries where like, you know, um, sort of superfluous sons of elite families who have no other prospects or whatever go into a monastery and the early church has to say, look, copying out books for God is not servile work or low status work, it's like important work. You know, it's good for you because this becomes the monastic ideology that like copying books is like good for the soul. It's a form of worship and a form of devotion, right? Then you get the late Middle Ages, you know, so maybe like 13th, but we get to say 14th century Paris. We find um, that there's a, you know, by 14th century Paris, we know a lot about the booksellers in that city. And there's big, rich booksellers on a scale that we never see in ancient Rome. And as far as we can tell, nobody gets really rich selling books in ancient Rome. But people get rich selling books in Paris, and um, that's because you can sell books to the church, and you can sell fancy Bibles to rich people, and you can sell books to universities, and you can rent textbooks to students. Even in the 14th century, they're <laughs> renting textbooks to students. You would rent them part of the book at the time, the student would take it home and copy it, and then they'd return it. Um, so part of what's going on there 
is that by the 14th century in Paris, there's a real explosion in lots of different needs people have for books. And that changes the market, and that changes the labor conditions. That's what makes it possible for the Europeans to adopt movable type printing. So sorry, I'm kind of veering into the book side away from the kind of work side. But one of the things we see is that this stuff is all deeply entangled in lots of other kind of culturally specific conditions. Yeah, thank you. It's a really good question. Yeah, yeah, please. <coughs> Enslaved scribes <coughs> were often that they were scribes before they were enslaved. Ah. Right? Um, I think I, I, I meant to say that they were, you had freed slaves, uh, sorry, freed scribes who had been scribes when they were enslaved. We don't, often don't know about people's lives before enslavement, and many of these people are born into slavery. So sorry if I wasn't clear. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Okay, where did they learn to be? Scribes, yeah. were they enslaved or not enslaved when they learned to be scribes? Yeah, so this is something we don't know a lot about, but there's basically you know, two ways you end up a slave in the Roman world. You're either born free and you get enslaved, or you're born into slavery. So it does seem pretty clear that people who are born into slavery are trained and educated in the household um, with skills that they're going to need in the household. And there's a lot of uses for literacy and numeracy in a large Roman household. So it's like not surprising that enslaved people who are born enslaved in the household, growing up to work in the household, are being taught these skills, which some, for some people get specialized into scribal skills, you know, like calligraphy or shorthand. Um, you know, in terms of people who are enslaved as adults, let's say, uh, you know, the Romans are constantly replenishing their supply of enslaved labor through conquest and capture. And you know, by and large, those are probably not happening in highly literate areas. But that having been said, there is a moment in the kind of early, the early part of what we call the late Republic, where the Romans are marching through Greece, mass enslaving the populations of Greece, capturing the libraries of Greece. And they are clearly bringing back into their households at Rome freeborn, now enslaved adults who are literate in Greek, who are of great value for teaching their children Greek. So, so that's, I think, kind of specific to the moment of the conquest of Greece. Um, but that's an example where people are being enslaved. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Well, I guess, I guess mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I, I yeah. assume it's, a, it's a, a pretty important skill and not very many people had it to yeah. describe. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. And so we do have, like I mentioned, we have a few of these contracts that suggest that um, enslavers would spend a lot of money, if necessary, to get an enslaved person trained with special scribal skills. So that's like this guy in, in Egypt. We have this, he's apprenticing one of his enslaved people who clearly has basic literacy to a, um, a person who, who runs a kind of scribal business. So in Egypt, things are a little bit different. But basically, this guy has a slave. He wants that slave to learn shorthand. He apprentices him to this like workshop. Um, the idea is that he'll learn shorthand there. We have, um, it is said of, of um, uh, uh, Titus Pomponius Atticus, the BFF of Cicero, and sometimes called his publisher, it is said of Atticus um, that every slave in his household, even the footmen and waiters, were trained to either copy books or read books out loud. So Atticus is clearly a special case. The point is that he's invested a lot of money in kind of you know double classing these these slaves. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Thank you. This is a wonderful talk. Thank you. Everything? Yeah. It, surely, mm. this, like, this is so yeah. widespread. Mm -hmm. I know you talked a little bit about this one particular case. But right. what, is there no grand danger that they're afraid of? Like, mm -hmm. Is anything happening? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can give you a couple kind of different illustrative anecdotes on this. There's an old Roman law that says that if a master of a house is killed by an enslaved person in his household, every single slave in the household should be interrogated for the legal inquiry, which means torture. Slaves are always tortured for testimony. And that law actually sort of mutates and becomes they should all be executed. So there's a case in the imperial period where um, a really rich guy is killed by one of his slaves, and hundreds of slaves 
are due for execution as a result of this. And people are like, look, this is too much. This is like just too much brutality, and the Senate has to decide on it. And there's like a protest outside the Senate, and people are like up in arms about this. And the emperor and the senator are basically like, you know what? This is how we preserve order, right? So, so you're, you know, um, uh, Seneca tells this story. He says in the Senate at one time, this is kind of like a, might be a made up anecdote. He says one time they were debating a law that would have required all slaves to wear distinguishing clothing to make it clear that they were slaves. And then they realized that if they did that, the slaves would realize how many of them there are <laughs> and how few there are of us. So there is an awareness, right, at, that, that, that at all times they are highly dependent on and like outnumbered by their enslaved people. And the way that they make that work is through basically two things. One, sheer terror, right? So this, this law I was telling you about, the point of that is that if you're an enslaved person and you hear your friend saying, ah, you know, I think I might kill the master, you have to be, the masters need you to absolutely know that it's in your best interest to turn him in rather than to help him. Because if he, if he does it, you're going to die, right? So there's this like really awful, bloody, kind of uh, overwhelming use of violence and terror to keep this stable. And then the other half of it is this ontological difference I was talking about. These really elaborate ideological and discursive systems, they're just telling people at all times, you're inferior, you're inferior, you're inferior, right? And we have manuals from the Roman world about how to do this. Um, uh, you know, they talk about, okay, you've got a big enslaved workforce on your farm or your factory. What you should do is you should put them all in little teams and make the teams compete. And whoever wins every day gets a prize and whoever loses gets punished. And then what they're doing is they're not thinking about themselves as a collective. They're not forming class consciousness, right? Um, so we can see that the Romans know that they have a problem, and they're constantly involved in, in trying to contain that problem. Yeah, 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 please. Listen. I was wondering if you've tried to or thought about in a broad way, like how we would incorporate this into teaching a regular Latin seminar. And your Virgil slide is maybe an example in that direction, but I was wondering if you thought about it more broadly. Other than just saying at the beginning of the semester, I know. here's how Roman production happens, I know. then we rest, talk about Virgil the rest of the semester. Like, how can we do it throughout? Yeah, I mean, this is what, you know, Michel Foucault talks about the author function mm -hmm. as this like common feature of Western literature. And I think also about author function as like, a thing we badly need in all of our mental habits. We need to be able to talk about Virgil because it makes things a lot easier, right? So the question you're asking me is, is, the, is one that I'm really stuck on. Um, because if this model is in any way accurate, then what it means is that we would not really find the seams, right? You know, if the model of collective authorship is, is how it works, then all the people who are working for Cicero to write Cicero's books are all working to write in Cicero's voice, you know, like speech writers for a politician. So yeah, the approach I was taking with Virgil was to see, well, you know, we're used in the study of Latin literature to looking for uh, certain conventional images of the author and of like thematizing authorship. You know, Catullus picks up his tablets or whatever, right? And so yeah, what I was getting at with Virgil is like maybe we could look for them thematizing the other version of how this is going on. And I don't know. Um, that Virgil one is just like the first time I've ever thought about it, you know, thought about looking for it. You have a thought on this? Well, yeah, just, I love the fact that, because intellectual property is so hot right now, and just like, how do, how do people, how do people, do, do we own our ideas anymore? Yeah. Man, if we're going to just allow AIs to suck this up, a very few people are going to get rich and nobody's going to have anything. So the, the interesting thing that, that Roman literature helps you see about this in, ancient, in the ancient context is nobody's getting paid for any of this. There's a different currency, right? There's a different currency behind intellectual, intellectual property, as it were. And it's all kind of like social, social capital, as it were. So I don't know. I mean, do you have any thoughts? How would you do it? <laughs> Looking, I think looking for traces throughout the text is a good start at least, mm -hmm. you know, like sort of like you were demonstrating with Virgil, sort of when we assign a passage, look for 
images of the author or think about the labor that goes into yeah. the production of the text and how we can bring that in. One, one way, one thing you might do, and this might be a fun idea for a seminar, would be to sit down with a text, like real canonical text by a real canonical author who we all really want to believe is a real guy, and say, okay, what happens if we set aside the label Cicero on, I don't know, the day of Fikiis, and let's read for all the things the text is doing to convince us it only has one author. Like, let's start from the premise that it doesn't have one author, even though we're used to thinking about that way. Now we'll read it, and as we'll read it, let's ask, well, how, how, how is the text trying to convince us of this? You, oh, um, one of the places that I've tended to start with this, and I have the luxury of working on scientific authors. Oh, right, sure. Um, is to begin with the piece of citation and attribution, mm -hmm. where we can start teasing out individual quoted authorial pieces. Yeah. And often the sources that are being quoted aren't necessarily a named author, but local sources in such and such a place. Right, right. Or we're dealing with um, a recipe that requires us to fill in the blanks of a process. Mm -hmm. um, experimental archaeology sometimes can provide some, um, some of the physical motions mm -hmm. that go into a process that results in a product. Yeah. But again, that's a luxury that you get when you're working with scientific authors, but also a lot of Pliny the Elders. So. I mean, I love the idea of taking a like Chen Epertoire approach yeah. to like Roman literature, you know. Well, but this is what I've been doing yeah. with my Africa piece. But I'll, Let's talk more about that. That yeah. sounds really interesting. But I mean, we'll talk about it in your talk. <laughs> Well, I think the thing that the thing that this makes me think of it is so sort of going back to the idea I was trying to like work out a minute ago is like um, well you mentioned scientific and technical writing and like you read something like Pliny the Elder and you start to realize that he's reading a lot of named authors and he's reading a lot of stuff that's like technical manuals that don't have names and then you start to think about like you know think about Dan Seldon's work on like. Um, on like text networks and anonymous novels in antiquity. And then I start getting the kind of creeping dread that maybe all of this high elite literature with named authors that our whole discipline is built around, maybe that's in some way a kind of minority section of the full life of literacy in the ancient world. And maybe polyphony is the natural state of ancient texts. And so again, maybe we start with polyphony and a poetics and a reading of polyphony um, and see if we think authors are there at all. You, you had a question. Uh, yeah. So um, I was wondering, and kind of wheeling it back to like the more work side of it, um, archaeologically and textually speaking, do we see a difference in how this work was divided in the um, Roman sphere, like between like you know the Greek East oh. and the Latin West, and like how like the, the subtle variations of that, like what yeah. the same like you know for like like you know the same like slave man like library system would that be like tra like transparent across the entire Mediterranean, or mm -hmm. is that more focused on Italy? Was that like how would that look like in Athens versus Alexandria? God, that's a really really good question, and. One of the difficult things about this is that the practices I'm talking about don't really leave archaeological traces directly. Um, a lot of the practices I'm talking about, we construe from literary sources that revolve around Italy and the metropoles of Italy. Okay. But we also get a clear sense that a lot of aspects of Roman book culture in the imperial period are transmitted and translated to the other metropoles. So, you know, there's probably very different things going on with book labor in Athens in the 5th century, the 3rd century, and then the 2nd century CE, you know? We know a little bit about, you know, who's working in libraries. And again, it does seem like once the Romans start, show up and start building Roman libraries in the Greek East, they seem to run more or less on a Roman model, which is to say you've got you've got a lot of slave labor, you've got a lot of in, formerly enslaved people appointed to kind of senior positions. Um, one, just one like interesting illustrative anecdote for this is there's a, a Latin word uh, that you'll become familiar with if you ever deal with Roman farms, which is villicus. Villicus is the enslaved overseer who runs the farm while the master is away. Um, and that word clearly comes out of the agricultural context. It's essential to the structure of Roman plantations. But when you go looking for it in the inscriptions, what you find is that by the high imperial period, the Romans are using it for other things. And you have inscriptions that show that like, we have someone who's described as being the villicus of the library. There's some sense that like Roman logic structures around this are being translated to other sorts of institutions. 
We have to also think about the difference between like the huge kind of like mega elite households that we see in these big metropoles and like what does literacy look like on the ground and like what's our best attested Egyptian city, Oxyrhynchus, which is like arguably kind of out in the boonies and yet has like insanely literate. Um, lots, of, lots of small households going through a lot of written material. Um, and so it's clear that like uh, the kind of specialization that we see in the big, you know, in the household of Livia in Rome is totally different from what you see in, you know, a household in Oxyrhynchus where there's a guy who like keeps his own checkbook but also can read Callimachus somehow. But the situation in Egypt is further complicated by the fact that Egypt, of all the places in the Roman Empire, has the most strata of literate culture under it, right? So you have, you have scribal culture in the hieroglyphic era, you have Ptolemaic scribal culture, then you have Roman scribal culture, and it's like, it's very hard to kind of untangle this stuff. So, I mean, I desperately wish this stuff left more material traces. Um, uh, there's a great recent book uh, that um, surveys the archeological record across the Roman Empire for ink wells. So mo all Roman writing surfaces are organic and, and don't survive, like parchment, papyrus, wood, except for like uh, total extremes. So in the like anaerobic bogs of Britain and in the like parched sands of Egypt is where we get Roman written material. Otherwise, this stuff doesn't survive. But inkwells are made of non-organic material. And so you start looking at the map of where people find inkwells and where inkwells are buried in graves, you get a very different picture of who's doing writing. And like, actually, lots of people are doing writing all the time for all parts of their life. And again, that takes us back to the idea that this literary book stuff is like, it's very rarefied. It's very concentrated in these hyper elite contexts. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the name of that book offhand? The author's name is Sierra Eckert. If you come up after the talk, I'll look it up for you, give it to you. Yeah, absolutely. It's called. I think it's called something like writing in power in the Roman something something. I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, given that the enslaved were so involved with scribing and reading and stuff, do you think there's a possibility that they even somehow injected some of their own influence in the writing? Maybe to a few words in the writing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is the question. And so, like, I think the, the traditional. The traditional view of Roman literature's response to what I've been talking about would be to say a version of what I said before, that like, okay, you have a lot of slaves involved in writing the literature, but it's all basically going before the master's eyes before it gets published. So, you know, there's n nothing is going to slip through. But I actually don't know if that's true. I think it would be interesting to read Roman literature looking for this stuff. Um, you know, we have very little Roman literature that survives where the author who's named on the book was himself formerly enslaved. It's a Roman poet called Phaedrus, who we're told is enslaved, and his poetry says really interesting stuff about slavery, but then scholars have often wanted to find reasons to say he wasn't really a slave. So this is, we got, I think we have a lot of kind of cleaning of our own house and questioning of our own assumptions to do to figure out the answer to that. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Please, yeah, in the back. Uh, what was the situation with intellectual theft and plagiarism? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, there is, well, you know, the word plagiarism, its Latin roots do have to do with the stealing of slaves. Um, uh, the, and there is, you know, the poetry of Marshall is a good place to look for this because he will just come out and accuse someone of passing another person's poems off as their own. It's, it's pretty funny stuff. Um, uh, there's a book about this by this guy called Scott McGill. Um, you know, what it, most of the surviving evidence for this basically gets back to the idea that you don't publish a book in Rome to get rich, you publish a book to get famous and to have people think you're smart and funny and clever. Um, but you don't actually ever publish a book in ancient Rome in the sense that we use the word publish because what you do is you write a book and then you give it to a friend and he makes some copies and gives it to his friends and actually for a lot of shorter poetic forms like epigram or elegy it seems like you might kind of do like mixtapes you might like write a few poems and it'll circulate as a pamphlet you know like you publish a book today and it circulates in a form that only a publisher could produce with like a binding and it looks nice and everything. And it seems like a big part of making a name for yourself for, with literature in the ancient world uh, 
is doing what we would call pre-publication, circulating in a form where actually you have very little control over it. It might get copied without your name on it. It might enter the, enter the record. Um, you know, I mean, I have to say, like, um, being here is just making me flash back to my college days in all sorts of ways. And when I was in college, we were downloading music from Napster. <laughs> and you could easily go and download a bunch of MP3s that would have the wrong metadata, you know, and attribute the songs to the wrong band or something like that. But it does, there is some in the Roman literature that talks about the anxieties of having your work circulating outside of your control. There's a pretty big overlap between the anxieties they express about the way your books move out of your control and the way that your slaves move out of your control when they're outside of your house. So Horace has a poem addressed to his book that he's published in which he talks to it like a slave who's like going into the city and is going to be out of his control and have all these adventures without him. Um, and so, you know, intellectual property, like when they think about property, the big kind of property that they experience in their day-to-day -day life is human property. I think it probably does shape their thought in pretty fundamental ways. Yeah. I'm going to let you tell us when we're done. Are we any, Keep going. Yeah? Any other questions? Could you, yeah, could you sure. elaborate on the connection of plagiarism and plagiarism? Um, gosh. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you the word. Hold on. I'm going to put my mic down. Never, never do this. Never live Google stuff in front of an audience. <laughs> uh, what am I looking for? Plagiaris. Yeah, there it is. OK, so this is not a word that's used a lot. But what this dictionary entry is telling us OK, what this dictionary word entry is telling us is that there is this word plagium. And it's attested in the legal sources. So this, uh, the digest is the big late antique compendium of all Roman legal writing. And there's this word plagium that, that refers to the crime of kidnapping someone and selling them as a slave. OK. Um, and so that gives us this word for a plagiarius, a plagiarist, a plagiarari. <laughs> a plagiarius is someone who, who kidnaps people and sells them as slaves. And that's the word that the poet Marshall uses to talk about a literary plagiarist. Now, uh, there's like one poem where he does this. <laughs> But arguably, this is the origin of the application of this word to this idea. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is the thing about all this for me that really kind of like gives me vertigo, is there's all sorts of ideas we have about what literature is, what authors and readers are, that have their origins in Roman culture. And then when you go back, you try to find where that plant actually is in the ground, the soil that it's growing in is slavery. And that makes me think like all the stuff we take for granted about like what literature and knowledge is and all, all this intellectual property, all this stuff. It's like maybe it's all, you know, it all comes out of this context. I don't know. Civil, oh yeah, right. There's no, there's no document of civilization. It's not also a document of barbarism, right? Okay. So any other questions? This has been so much fun. Thank you all so, so much. <laughs> <laughs>